the call on this computer. Okay. All right, so this is your, your new course, International Financial Management, first session, but we will have a, a little bit of a discussion on the submission of the project report for the previous course. So what you do is, uh, please make sure you follow the same format. Even the previous occasion, people made some errors, even though I wrote everything down. Uh, make sure you follow all this, okay? This type, font, size, date format, it should be the date. There should be no rows for Saturday and Sunday. Only trading days are to be mentioned, okay? And so there's a small change in the ending date, uh, which is, uh, it used to be for, uh, it was earlier 24th December, now I'm making it 23rd December, uh, because ma'am is now asking for the day, uh, the results one day earlier than she was asking for them earlier. So, so uh, I have to push everything forward by one day. So your submission dead deadline is, is not midnight actually, it's uh, 25th December, uh, noon, okay? Uh, 25th December, noon is the bed deadline, okay? So Christmas, this is your Christmas present. So always remember, refer to uh, periods as uh, midnight or noon. Uh, that is better than putting AM and PM. Okay, and then there's a, I will link, put the link to the uh, presentation video in case you have a problem. So make sure you follow those all, uh, the whole uh, thing given in the, in the video here, okay? With your, um, uh, all your report, all your uh, account statements and uh, in the same format as you did for uh, IPM. Same format as we followed, and, and just put this starting date of the project uh, from the Monday on the way all the way up to here till the 20. Uh, so close the trading tonight, okay? 23rd December, close the trading tonight, and I'll give you because 24th also I think Christmas Eve not much will happen, so I'll give you one day, uh, one and a half days to prepare all the reports and submit to me by 25th December noon. All right, okay. So that's as far as that is concerned. That's for your the first uh, yeah, this notes is not required. Okay, so that's your first topic, project. The second topic is I'm just gonna make this merry weather. I don't like this this is the best font. Okay. All right, so we'll start with our, uh, what we are going to do is actually we are going to, although we are in a new course, because we are, what we were covering is actually pretty important, which is the uh, arbitrage free valuation uh, relationships, okay? So it's very important to get an understanding of this is one of the most important uh, ideas in finance, arbitrage free valuation, and whole uh, idea of CRA itself. So, and uh, this is part of our larger discussion on We'll make it a larger discussion on, I'm going to put the notes here, and then I will later on, I'll create a new file for that, okay? So this is essentially what we are studying here is, so fair value models in finance, okay? That's what we are studying. And as part of that, we are getting into the discussion of arbitrage free valuation, and we will continue with that discussion with some of the other relationships. So just to place it in context, uh, what is this uh, fair value? So, so all these courses that you see these days now, it's a buzzword to talk about financial modeling. Actually, all those courses, what they typically will do is, uh, I've not seen all of them, but many of them that I've seen, they have the same, uh, did I take the link for that? Yeah, okay. So essentially what these courses will do is if you go back to this DP4 solution, okay, if you're talking about fair value models in finance, if that's the overall module within which we are having our discussion on Arbit AFV, okay? So uh, there typically most of those modeling courses will focus on this part and that too mainly on this part here. And that too usually they focus on one type of valuation which is the what we call enterprise value model, okay? So enterprise value model, and then using that to arrive at the final stock valuation. So that is typically what is mostly discussed, and you have some spreadsheet modeling, but there's actually a lot more to models in finance than just this. So this, the, these courses typically give you a very narrow perspective. So the right way to think about models is that these are all actually 
most of the models that you do, these are all fair value models. So the right way to think about them is to think about them as fair value models. So you can have um, two types. You can have, maybe I can save myself some writing. You can have this, okay. Excuse me, sir. Yes. Sir, I can't see the screen. I Can I leave the meeting and join again? Yeah, 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 you can do that. Yeah, everybody else can see, right? Well, most of anybody else is having a problem watching the screen, uh, seeing the screen? Nobody else, okay, good. So yeah, you can leave, uh, you can leave and come back. Yeah. I don't know, in fact, even my uh, view is very strange, actually. My, I normally get a different kind of view, and uh, okay, maybe I think I've just gone to, um, I should get a speaker view. What am I getting? I need a gallery view. But in the gallery view, I can only see myself. Um, it's very strange. Anyway, uh, I think it's okay. It's, uh, let's ask a few of the participants. I mean, just this one. Because normally I see everybody's name here. Today I'm not seeing them. Um, Zoom is updated, that's why you're showing the different way. Okay, so the Zoom has updated the software. Okay, good. Uh, so at least somebody else can hear me, so that's fine. So if anybody else has a problem, just let me know. Yeah, and if you have, you can just uh, leave. I think that was Nikita. Uh, she can uh, go and uh, she can go, go out and come back in. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so the first type of fair value model, we've already done this a little bit before, but I'm just recapping because it's a fairly important idea in finance. So you need to have the right context, okay? So fair value model, so quickly to recap, maybe I don't need to write it. So you have forecast pre evaluation and then you have AFB, okay? Um, then you have AFB, which you know what it is, okay? So we'll, uh, we'll just try to put, uh, These are the two approaches, okay? Now, uh, this is arbitrage pre evaluation, and within AFP itself, uh, there are two types, okay? Um, so you can have, that's what we have listed here, 2A, which is true, true AFP, and the, the fake AFP, okay? And the fake AFP, which is, using the, why are we calling it fake? Because it uses the techniques of arbitrage fee evaluation. Fake AFV, and so fake AFV is uh, the classic uh, option, uh, the, the classic case of fake AFV is all option models, all option valuation models. All of them are fake AFV. Why are they fake AFV? Because they use, uh, use the technique of AFV, but in fact, uh, CRA can't be performed through, CRA can't be performed to make the market price converge. Again, my spelling is not correct. Converge to the fair value. Remember, the whole thing is lynched. Uh, the whole, um, it should be converged, okay? Remember this whole valuation business. The thing to remember about valuation is fair value models in finance, when you get into fair value models, one, one thing you should remember, if you use only TA, you don't need to bother with value or fair value models. 
okay? With value and hence with fair value models. This is also very important to understand. We are recapping a little bit, I'm repeating a little bit, but it's important, these are very important things, so uh, we should repeat these things and so make sure that, uh, uh, and you'll not find this mentioned in any textbook like this, so it's important that I clarify these very important things for you. Uh, these are uh, important aspects of your context and your knowledge. Um, okay. So you have enhanced uh, fair value models, okay? So the main thing to understand here is that if you are, we are concerned really, the whole discussion arises only in the context of buy and sell. Should I buy or sell something? So when I'm looking at Aflac, Aflac is an insurer, okay? Should I buy this stock or should I sell this stock? This, when I have to worry about this question, this fundamental question, I could also solve this question using TA, in which case I am not bothered with uh, this whole question of value. So the question of value only arises, this is the first thing that you should understand, that uh, if you are using TA, you don't need to worry about uh, this whole question of value. It only arises when you are not using TA and you are using FA. You are in this other box, FA and other techniques, okay? This FA stands here for fundamental analysis, okay? And you're using this other kind of paradigm. So in this paradigm, remember, the whole idea here is that you compare the price to the value. So you look at this, and if you find that the fair value, according to you, the fair value is $60, and you find that the price is now 44, so you would be buying it because you think that the price, because the implicit idea in this whole model if you're using this framework, that means you believe that eventually the market has to move towards the fair value, okay? So, therefore, if the fair value estimate according to you is $60 and the price is 44, you would buy it because you believe eventually the price move is going to move towards 44, uh, towards $60 and you're gonna make money out of that, okay? So this whole thing is based on this idea. All fair value models are, you know, common, they have this common characteristic that they all implicitly believe that the price, the market price is going to converge to the fair value. And these two different approaches, these are different approaches to estimating the fair value, but it does not, what does not change is that both of them believe that once I've found the fair value and I think it's different from the, and it's different from the market price, depending on whether the market price is lower or higher, I will be a buyer or a seller. And the idea is that the price eventually has to converge to fair value, okay? So in the case of forecast-based valuation like you do for stocks, like you do for a project, okay? So this valuation is necessarily subjective because the earnings estimates, okay? Or you want to call it the cash flow, uh, the free cash flow to the firm estimates if you're using enterprise value, okay? All those estimates, those are all estimates, just ideas that come out of your head. Different people have different estimates. So it's a subjective assessment and there's no guarantee that it will come out to be correct. You're just betting that it will happen, okay? There's no guarantee. The only place where there's a guarantee is when you have true AFV. When you have true AFV like FX forwards, FX cross rates, we saw an example of FX cross rates earlier, okay? In the previous course, towards the end, we calculated FX cross rates, AFV for FX cross rates. And we saw that there was an arbitrage opportunity if the prices are different, okay? And the way you make this, in this case, what happens is here, the, uh, the synthetic euro, is, the synthetic euro yen was coming out to be here. What did we find? That the synthetic was 125.90 and the direct was 125.92 in the euro yen market. So the way this arbitrage works is, here, there are no restrictions. All the prices are available to us. I can either deal directly in the Euro Yen market or I can do deals in uh, Dollar Yen and Euro Dollar FX independently and synthetically create a Euro Yen position, okay? So all these prices are available to me in the market. There's no guesswork. There's no forecasting involved. I can see everything in the market. I can hit the prices lock in everything right now. And this, what happens is, therefore, as I lock in everything, as I start to do the arbitrage, where is the arbitrage here? 
Yeah. Yeah, because the synthetic is cheaper than the direct. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to buy the synthetic and I'm going to sell the direct. Okay, and everybody else in the market is also going to start doing this because they can all see this difference. Okay, because this method of deriving the synthetic price is well known to everybody. So everybody's going to start doing this. And so what's going to happen? As everybody starts doing this, they are buying the synthetic and they're selling the direct. The synthetic price will start going up because there's excess demand in the synthetic market. And this price will start moving towards 125.92. And everybody will sell, start selling the direct. So there'll be excess supply in the direct market. So the price will fall. And so the direct will start moving from 125.92 to 125.90. Okay. So this is how the convergence happens. Okay. People start doing the arbitrage and this, this puts pressure on both the different markets and the prices converge. And that's how this magic happens, this magic that you believe in here. The fair value and the price will converge to the fair value. This is the magic that you believe in. And only in true AFB cases can you guarantee that this will happen. Everywhere else, it's a gamble. You buy, fair, you buy Aflac, because according to your estimate of the cash flows, fair, the fair value of Aflac should be $60. Today it's 44, but no one really knows if it's actually gonna to go to $60. It might or it might not, okay, it's a gamble. But here there is no gamble. In true AFB, there is no gamble. And one example of that, which you saw last in the last class was FX cross rates. Okay, very important to understand these transactions, which are uh, examples of true AFB, where you can actually trade in the synthetics simultaneously and trade in the direct synthetic uh, direct market direct simultaneously and if there is a price difference you can buy one sell the other lock in everything no market risk remains okay so this is the idea so uh, in the case of true afb we call it true afb because you can perform the arbitrage that makes the prices converge so we should make this clear here what is the difference between true afb and fake afb once I write the note here for fake AFB, you can then see what is the characteristic of true AFB. In fake AFB, the, uh, it uses the technique of AFB. Okay, let's say we call it, let it uses. That means the, the models, okay? The models use the, uh, let's make it very clear here. The, the fake AFB models, like the option valuation models, all of them, okay? All of them have the same property, whether binomial or Black-Scholes or garmin Kohlhagen, all option valuation models have the same property. The, the model uses the technique of AFB, okay? Um, what is the technique of AFB briefly? That is, direct price should be same as synthetic price. That is basically the model, okay? Remember, this is the logic that is given in your notes. If you go back here, somewhere I've given the logic, the algorithm of uh, arbitrage-free valuation. Somewhere here. Yeah, so the CRA strategy algorithm, find out if there is a synthetic equivalent. What is the market price of the synthetic? Okay, and then basically uh, the uh, synthetic equivalent and the actual direct market price should be the same. And that's the basic principle of AFV. Okay, so the, all these models, uh, and let's put it multi plural, okay. These models use the technique of AFV, that is direct price should be same as synthetic price. This is the basic idea, okay. If you don't understand anything here that I'm mentioning, okay, this is very important for you to understand as finance students, the whole idea of all these fair value models, what are they trying to estimate? This background that you're always going to compare fair value to price and then take action accordingly because price has to converge to fair value, that is the belief. And then the different types of fair value models, because you will not find this written in any finance textbook or any other book anywhere in the world. So you better understand this, but it's very important for your own understanding and perspective on models 
because you will be encountering models later on in your life. You need to know where to place which kind, which kind of model. So if you don't understand anything, even a comma or a full stop, you have to interrupt and ask me, okay? As I'm explaining, so we are repeating a little bit. So these models use the technique of AFE, okay? But in fact, the CRA can't be performed, okay? So basically the problem, the reason these are fake is, this is the, this is the reason they are fake. Because the, you cannot actually perform any CRA. CRA means classical riskless arbitrage, which means instantly you must be able to buy and sell in the direct and synthetic markets and lock in all the prices. What you saw uh, in terms of your, um, the, uh, in, the, uh, in the book by Nattenberg, okay? Uh, if you see the book where we talk about option arbitrage, okay, so all those buys and sells, synthetics, uh, those can all be done instantly because you can see all the prices and you can access them. In the case of fake AFE models like option valuation models, the uh, CRA can't be performed, and uh, therefore uh, the market price cannot converge, will not necessarily converge to the fair value. You can't force it to converge. Here you can force it to converge because what is gonna happen is people are gonna constantly buy here. The direct is higher than the synthetic. People are gonna constantly be buying, they'll be buying the synthetic in massive volumes and simultaneously selling the direct in massive volumes. It will force the prices to converge. Here, and this is happening as a result of the CRA being done by uh, many people in massive volumes. Okay, it puts pressure on the prices. In the case of fake AFB, since the CRA can't be performed, you don't have any pressure to make the profit price converge to the fair value. That's why it's fake CRA, fake CRA, okay? And in the case of true AFB, we can give you examples, okay? So these are already given in the sheet. I'm not writing them here, but the main thing is here that um, and here the difference is the CRA can be performed to force the market price to converge to the fair value. Okay? This is the basic idea here, okay? So these are the two class classifications, okay? And uh, this is what you should understand as in terms of your perspective. So I've put all option valuation models here. Now we are not going to go into the working of the option valuation models because we don't have the time. And there's not much value addition from that, except that I'm just, you can read up on it later on. In the Nattenberg book, it will be a little bit more user-friendly than the Hull book. Uh, so, but the main idea in the option valuation model is the same thing that they try to apply the technique of AFB, which means basically this principle. They've applied this rule that the direct price should be the same as the synthetic price. And they try to set up a synthetic portfolio which will behave like the option. And then they say that the cost of the synthetic portfolio should be the same as the option. But the problem here, of course, is that if we go back to our um, We'll just have a discussion. We are continuing this discussion on uh, fair value models in finance. Very important because you need to understand this uh, logic clearly. These guys have also made some changes. They've added some colors. Right, now what is the problem? Why am I calling this a fake AFV? Because these are the model outputs. Okay, this is actually the model output, and this comes from put call parity, which is another uh, AFV relationship which actually works. Uh, and so, this is let's say this is the model output. Okay, this is the model output, and these are all the model inputs. Okay, these are all the model inputs. Graph increment is not really a model input, rounding and graph increment, these are part of the uh, user interface of this particular piece of software, this web page, web-based software, which is showing you that this is just, uh, you know, uh, sort of related to this software, rounding and graph increment. We don't need to worry about this, but these are the inputs. These are all the inputs, as you are aware, okay? Now, the problem with this is that this can be readily observed 
this is given by the user this is also given by the user this can also be observed okay we know what the interest rate is for 30 days this can also be more or less known okay dividends can change but in the short run at least we have some stability in dividends now the problem is the problem arises with the ball okay so the reason that these models although they use the afv technique the reason these are actually fake afv is because this this input is actually an this is not known okay this is not known unlike if you go back here this stuff here all these are known to us i can see this price i can see this price i can see this price i can trade in any of the markets by trading here and trading here i can create a synthetic euro yen position by trading here i can create a direct euro yen position so i'm able to trade in all three markets okay and uh, instantly lock in all the prices so that if there's any difference between the synthetic price and the actual price or the direct price i can immediately arbitrage that difference the problem in this is this how you use this model is as a trader as a trader or as a market maker you look at option prices maybe the price of the option in the market with this these are the parameters okay except for this okay now maybe the price of the option in the market is actually uh say five dollars let's just say for any as an example it's five dollars okay now if if this is if the actual call option price is five dollars but according to you the vol for this next 30 day period the vol should be 25 okay so when you enter a vol of 25 this is your remember this is your subjective estimate okay when you're doing a fair value analysis okay not when you're doing implied vol but when you're doing a fair value analysis so when you're applying this kind of a model, you're applying an AFP model to options. You know that the market price is here is $5, okay? But as you, when you do this model, what is this model actually telling you? Remember, what is the fair value model telling you actually? Let's also understand the, the basics of fair value models, okay? Logic is, Okay, or logic or uses if the inputs have the values we assign to them then the output should have the value thrown out by the model okay this is basically what a fair value model is doing just very basic stuff but you need to be very clear about the logic what are you doing if you go back to the stuff that you guys are familiar with what is this project npv if we just do it here project npv is actually a cost of the project on one side okay i mean as one of the elements and this is the fair value of the project fair value of the project all right so what do you do with your npv on the lhs you have the npv okay and what is the npv equal to actually the npv is equal to maybe we should put this on this side because we will do minus we will instead of writing the cost as a minus we will deduct the cost from the fair value so we can take this here okay and in fact we can say cost of the project and remember we said cost is equal to market price if you have any confusion about that just imagine that delhi metro is buying a chunk of uh, track they are buying a chunk of metro track taking the metro from either port to karnal and it's just a ready-made chunk of line which they just come and drop on the on the ground and they can just buy it okay they can buy it for 50 million dollars and that's your uh, and that's a 
what you would put as a cost to the project, but it's actually like a market price because you're essentially buying it from the contracting company like l &T, okay? So what are you doing in NPV? You're actually saying the fair value of the project, okay, which uh, maybe we should put here because it looks ugly here. Okay, yeah, so you're taking the fair value. The NPV is on the left-hand side and the NPV is equal to the fair value of the project minus the cost of the project, okay? So we write this as a C0 with a minus sign, okay? Now, so I've just put it this on this side and then minus this. So this minus this, and this is based on your estimates. So fair value of the project is all those cash flows that you project for the project, and then you discount the cash flows using the weighted average cost of capital or depending on how you financed it, okay? So if you use weighted average WAC as a general format, then if you have all equity financing, then the WAC is equal to the cost of equity. So anyway, so that's what you're doing. So essentially what is, so this is a fair value model. This is an example of a fair value model. Why? Because this model is telling you that if the inputs have the values that we assign to them, then the NPV of this project, which is the NPV here is the output, okay? The NPV of this project will be equal to, okay, this minus this, okay? So this is also going into very basic logic to understand what a fair value model is trying to do. It is trying to tell you basically that if the inputs have the values that we assign to them, then the output should have the value thrown out by the model, okay? It sounds kind of very obvious saying that, you know, like uh, after 10 o'clock, you know, then next hour is 11 o'clock. It's almost something very basic, but it's still important to be clear about these things. What is the fair value model trying to do? Now, the reason I'm putting out this kind of very basic statement here is that we need to understand now this is also a fair value model, okay? An option valuation model is also a fair value model. So how is the trader using this option fair value model? What is he doing? He is saying that, okay, fine. I see that the market price is $5 for the call option with these parameters. But, you know, I don't really trust the market price. I have a different view. According to me, the vol input for this period should be 25%. Okay, it should not be, this is a percentage figure. Okay, it should be 25%. It should not be whatever the market is using. And so if I enter 25 as the vol input in this model, this is a fair value model. So the way it works is that if the inputs have the values we assign to them, and here, according to me, the vol input should be 25% because the vol over the next 30 days is going to be 25%. And if I enter this, then the output should have the value that is thrown out by the model. And the value thrown out by the model is $3. Let's just round it out to $3. Whereas the market is showing $5, okay? So now can someone tell me whether, based on this information, that what we have here, the theoretical price. Remember, this is a theoretical price. This is what is meant by fair value. This is another term that you will see often used in fair value models. Theoretical price, why is it called theoretical? Because the theory says, okay, this value theory thrown out by the model is often called the theoretical price. It's a theoretical price because it need not actually be the price that prevails in reality. It will be the price in reality only when you have true AFV where you can force the market price to converge to the fair value. Otherwise, it will be just a theoretical price, which need not be the actual price. It's a theoretical price, because according to my theory of the option pricing, option valuation model, if the inputs have the values that we assign to them, and these are the values we have assigned, then the output should, then the output should, here, we'll put this here then the output should have the value thrown out by the model. That is, in this case, the output is actually the call option price. It should have the value that is thrown out by my model, which is $3, which means what I'm saying is, I am looking at the market price of this call option and it's a, it shows me $5. But I say, no, the market is wrong because according to my fair value model, I enter the inputs into my fair value model and according to me, the wall input should be 25, okay? 
Not that it is actually 25 because no one can see what this is, okay? This is just some estimate that exists in my head. I think it should be 25, which is as subjective as, if you remember here, when we go to project NPV, if I'm projecting year five cash flows as $300 million, there is no guarantee that that will actually be 300 million. This is just an idea in my head. Sachin may say, no, no, it will be 250. Okay, Sambhavna might say, no, no, it will be 190. And everybody can be right. We can't say that one person is right and the other person is wrong. These are all numbers which are just being thrown out by people. In the same way, this is what is happening here. I am just throwing out a number. According to me, it should be 25. Okay, so this is what is happening. So therefore, I, according to me, the fair value should be $3. Now, the problem here is that you can't, the reason this is fake AFB is, you have to understand, that there is no way for me to force the $5 market price to come down to this. So what I would do here is that, since my fair value is lower than the market price, I would sell the market price, which means I would sell the option at $5, and I would try to create a synthetic long position in the option, okay? If my forecast turns out to be correct, that the actual ball turns out to be 25%, and if I actually am able to hedge according to the way that the model has uh, imagined, okay, which is also not true, which is not possible to do in practice, okay? So these models are all deeply flawed because the assumption is that the, the hedging is continuous, but nobody actually hedges continuously. So this, these models are all deeply flawed, but let's assume that even if you can hedge continuously as the model imagines, and the actual ball ends up being 25. In that case, if that happens, in that case, the cost of my synthetic long will be this $3, okay? In that case. But there is no guarantee that the actual ball that will happen over the next 30 days is 25%. It could be 95%, it could be 10%, it could be 15%, it could be anything. No one knows, okay? So there's no way to be certain about this. And that is the fundamental difference between a fake AFP model, like an option valuation model, and a model which I showed you here, which is the FX cross rate pricing model. There's nothing fake about this. This is a true AFP model because the inputs that are required in the FX cross rate pricing model, they are all observable prices in the marketplace and you can directly trade on them. And there is nothing uncertain about this. Here, the vol input, this is just a number that exists in my head and there is no guarantee that this number will turn out to be true. Whereas in the case of uh, FX cross rate pricing models, these numbers are all available in the market. You can trade on them. Therefore, the market price has to be equal to the synthetic. In fact, when people quote the market price, in the case of Euro Yen, it's a very active market. So people will know the direct market price. But in the case of less liquid cross markets, cross rates, what will happen is they will actually do the synthetic price and then they will quote that as the direct price. So to, they ensure that there is no arbitrage opportunity. Okay, that's how it's done. So there is a very big difference. So that's what you have to understand about option valuation models. Okay, again, very few places, you will hardly find this kind of a discussion anyway, so you don't really understand. Uh, but this is what you have to understand about option valuation model, that these are actually fair value models. So they are not necessarily connected to the market price. The reason you use a fair value model is really to say, that I think the market is wrong. I think the actual price, the theoretical fair value of this call option is $3, not $5. And that's because my ball estimate is 25, okay? So this is how it works. So this is now you understand why, okay? I have repeated myself a little bit, but these are very important concepts. So I wanna make sure that everybody understands, okay? So, in the case of the, fair, the fake fair value model, because this is a subjective estimate, I cannot do a risk-free CRA. Okay, what I can do is I can sell the option price in the market at $5, and then I can start synthetically replicating the 
you know, synthetic equivalent of the option over the next 30 days. But the true cost of doing that, okay, whether it is actually ends up being $3 or less or more, that I will not know until the end of 30 days. So it's very different from the case of the Euro yen where I have no uncertainty. Everything is locked in right now. I see all the differences and bang, 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 I just do all the trades and I lock in everything instantly. Whereas here, I don't know the full cost of creating my synthetic equivalent position until 30 days are over because I'll be trading constantly for the next 30 days, balancing my riskless portfolio, okay? Uh, to create a synthetic long option position to balance against the short option that I directly sold in the marketplace. So that's why this is a fake AFV because there is no way to do an arbitrage and remove all the market risk and lock in the price and force the market price to converge to the theoretical fair value. And the other reason there is a problem here is that these are all subjective fair values. Now, everybody in the market doesn't have the same ball estimate. I think it should be 25. Somebody else will think it should be 35. Somebody else will think it'll be 45. Okay, someone might think it's 15. So these are all subjective estimates. So therefore, these are actually more like uh, so this, these option OVMs, they use the AFV technique, okay, which is to set up a synthetic equivalent and then make sure that the market price has the same price as the cost of doing the synthetic equivalent position, of generating the synthetic equivalent position. This is an AFV valuation technique. But because you can't perform the arbitrage, Therefore, there's no way to make the market price converge to the fair value. And therefore, they are actually more like the subjective fair value models here. Okay. The forecast-based fair value models that you see here, like your stocks and bonds and project costs and all that. These are all subjective models because they are based on your subjective estimates of the cash flows you made over here, you projected here to arrive at the fair value of the project. These are all projections. There's no guarantee that this will come out to be true. Just like there's no guarantee that this will come out to be true. Okay? So this is the point. So you have to understand this. This is why these are uh, fake fair value models, uh, fake AFV models. Okay? Uh, but these are all fair value models. Okay, so let's go back to this. So I spent quite a bit of time on this, but they're very important concepts. It's important that everybody understand this. Okay, uh, so I'll set, set up a separate sheet for this later on. A separate document. Okay. Now, uh, here we have already covered all this stuff. So why this is fake AFB? Because the CRA cannot be performed. Okay. Just a quick quiz. Uh, so if my ball estimate is my subjective estimate projection about what will happen, what will be the ball for the next 30 days is 25 and I'm getting a fair value estimate of $3. And the actual market price is uh, $5. So my question here is, so what can we say about the eyeball here? Is the eyeball higher than 25 or lower than 25 for this option? So it's They're higher than 25. Uh, higher. They're higher. Okay, very good. Okay, so you have now understood what eyeball is. Sir? Yes. Sir, like, Sir, Mitali, this is it. Sir, like you are saying that volatility, uh, we have to put, like it's a subjective thing. But uh, when we use uh, our uh, TWS account, yeah. it shows volatility of the uh, options. So we can't, uh, can we put uh, those input here? Yeah, so that idea, so that's the whole idea of eyeball, okay? So if you put that, so you're almost there. Now I will just one, add one more statement to your whatever you have said. If you put that, suppose you go and see the TWS, okay? So this is how eyeball is derived. We have already done this exercise once, so I'll do it later again. Uh, so I'll do it very quickly. So eyeball is basically got, eyeball is, uh, is, a, uh, is, the, is the ball input in the OVM that will create a theoretical price which is equal to the market price. So if I see that the market price is $5, and this is actually how you find out the eyeball, okay? 
and I've given the uh, there's a section later on in your notes okay which we will do uh, but that you can read up on your own okay the eyeball reference I have given in the Hal Basu book how to derive the uh, ball as uh, you know the that's that's a separate matter but this uh, the eyeball estimate what is eyeball how do you derive the eyeball this is you can read this part later okay you can I will not refer to it too much but this is how you derive the eyeball you see that the market price is five dollars so you see that with a ball input of 25 the theoretical price is three dollars that's not good enough so let's try something higher see what happens okay now it's too much it's a little bit over five dollars so then i try to reduce it a little bit maybe make it 41. maybe make it 41 then make it uh, 42 maybe yeah, so we are almost there. So if I make it 42.5, maybe, yeah, thus we are almost there basically. So I should maybe, maybe make it 42.45 or something like that. That will bring us to almost $5. Now rounded up, we are at $5, uh, at $5, right? So this is how you do it, okay? You start with 25. You find that if you have, your estimate was 25. So that's what you think is going to happen over the next 30 days. But the market has a different view. The market price is much higher than what would be consistent with 25. So the way you derive, and this is how now you say that the eyeball for this option is 42.45. Because that's the input into the OVM that creates a theoretical price that is equal to the market price. So the market price is derived at, the market price is derived by, uh, the interaction of supply and demand okay people are buying and selling options and that's pushing the price around excess demand excess supply and that creates a price of five dollars on the side separately you are working your fair value model and in the fair value model you find that in order to generate a price equal to the market price of five you need to put in a ball input of 42.45 and so that's when you say that this is the eyeball. And in fact, this is how the eyeball is calculated. So those, when you look at the TWS and you, when you mouse over the bids and offers and you get a percentage figure, those are the eyeball figures. Now, how did they come out with those figures? They did the same thing. Obviously they did it much faster because it's automated, but they did the same thing that I just did. They uh, put in an arbitrary number Okay, like a guessing, uh, you know, algorithm, you put in an arbitrary number and then you try to converge, like you keep raising it or lowering it until you get to the market price. Okay, so that's how you do it. So in fact, eyeball is calculated like that. So that exercise is shown to you over here. I think if you go to your Halbasu page 339, you will see this is this coding is 339 in book me. This is the page number printed on the digital book. And this is the metadata that is what you look for in the PDF uh, page numbers which you enter. Okay, uh, so if you go there, you'll find that this is calculated like this. Okay, so uh, this is the idea here. So that's what we have discussed uh, in this uh, part here. That this is why these are fake AFP models because these are subjective estimates. So because these are subjective estimates, first of all, different people have different estimates. Okay, so some people might be selling the actual market and some people may be buying the actual market because they have different uh, fair value estimates, which may be higher or lower than the fair actual market price. So that's why there is no uniformity in terms of selling or buying in one direction to push the price down. And second is because these are not certain, okay, there's no certainty that your actual market price, the actual ball is going to be 25. This, this is just your estimate. So based, because there is no certainty, there is market risk. You don't know the cost of the full hedge until 30 days have passed. So therefore you don't have the confidence to, uh, just hold on a sec, okay, I'll just.
Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, so this is basically it. The, the 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 reason you don't have the reason you can't force the market to converge to the fair value market price is because the uh, the fair value estimate is a subjective estimate, and therefore, and you can't lock in the prices and uh, you know remove all the market risks. So, you don't have the confidence to do this in large volumes. That's the second reason why it doesn't converge. Okay, so this is the fake fair value model. Uh, fake AFV model. We have a message in the chat. Okay, yeah. yeah, yeah, you guys can leave. Those who are leaving for the group discussion can leave. Those who are going for the group discussion. Okay. All right. So let's continue here with this uh, discussion here. So we are talking about fair value models in finance. Okay, and this whole this whole discussion of arbitrage free valuation is important to understand properly. Let's go back to this. Yeah, so we saw one. So these are all different applications of AFV. Okay, we saw the application to FX cross rates, true AFV application. You should be able to do this in different asset classes. So this was in currencies. This was in currencies. So there are some examples. Let me give you some examples here. Okay, so true AFV uh, examples here would be, okay, this, this is important to understand, okay? So true examples, let's copy some of them from here. FX, so this should not be two actually. Examples are FX cross rates, then FX forwards, FX forwards, that is, we will not have time to discuss FX forwards, but you can read up on it on your own. And I've given you a book in one of your, in your financial reference, there's a book here, there. Okay, so this should actually be true for, only for convertible currency FX pairs, okay? Freely convertible currencies. Okay, convertible means freely convertible on the capital account. So this does not include the Indian rupee because you can't. So the idea here is all these cases where you have, uh, you know, true arbitrage free valuation. What will happen is, you should be able. The main test is, you should be able to perform the arbitrage. You should be able to perform the arbitrage. There should not be any barriers. Okay. What else do you have? You have all these cases that we have discussed. You have, uh, what did we discuss? Synthetics, okay. Sir, I have a question. Yeah, yeah. Sir, um, isn't the Japanese yuan like in, uh, in terms of uh, compared to dollars less than the Indian rupees? So why is the Indian rupees like not considered truly convertible whereas the Japanese yuan is? No, it's not the yuan, first of all. <laughs> it's not yuan. That is the Chinese Japanese yuan. yen, sorry, yen. Japanese yen. yen. Yeah. No, that's sorry, sorry. Yen. Actually, you're saying that the value of the dollar yen is uh, higher than the value of the dollar rupee. Okay. That's a different matter. That's you're saying that this these two have different values. The convertibility, free convertibility on the capital account is a different thing altogether. It talks about the uh, rules that exist in the country. Like in India, you cannot freely transfer... Uh, money out from uh, you know uh, from India to uh, you know other countries to if you want to buy Swiss francs or you want to buy you're always constra constrained by the uh, RBI rules okay on uh, so so the free rupee is free not freely convertible on the capital account so if you just want to take a punt if you just want to take a punt on the dollar uh, you know dollar Swiss franc or Indian rupee versus Swiss franc rate you can't, uh, here you can see the dollar yen is around the 105, okay, and what Saurya is saying is, but dollar yen is 105 and dollar rupee is uh, 75 or whatever, okay, right, 76, 75. So what Saurya is saying is that dollar yen is uh, much higher than uh, dollar rupee. So why is it not, why do we say, so there are two different things actually. One is the relative valuation of the currency, uh, and the other is the uh, 
con I mean, the conditions or the uh, regulatory environment for capital transfers. In Japan, there is no limit. You know, Japanese investors, Japanese individuals can freely, if a Japanese person can, uh, wants to, uh, you know, suddenly buy uh, 50 million uh, Australian dollars and sell yen against it, they can do it. They are not subject to any kind of uh, regulatory restriction like the Japanese Central Bank has not put uh, you know conditions on the local banks. Uh, whereas in India now, if you suddenly feel that uh, Shaurya wants to go and uh, buy a lot of Swiss francs, he wants he feels that the Swiss franc will appreciate against the rupee. He wants to sell rupees and buy Swiss francs. He can't do that because uh, there are restrictions on what he can do. In fact, one of the pieces of software that I was using earlier, I'm not able to use now in India because they're not able, they're not making it available in India because of the capital restrictions in India, the uh, uh, capital capital movement restrictions in India for, because the rupee is not freely convertible. So is this clear? So this is uh, due to government restrictions and bank uh, RBI's restrictions. That's why it is not due to like the co convertible value or anything like that. No, no, that is what we mean by convertibility. What we mean by convertibility, we say freely convertible currencies, okay? The, what we mean by convertibility is this uh, feature of not having any restrictions. Okay, so okay, sir. these are developed countries like uh, Switzerland, Canada, US, Japan, UK, they don't have uh, uh, Australia, Australia used to have it. Uh, they used to have restrictions till 1980. In the mid 80s, I think 84, 1984, they stopped it. So in 1984, they allowed the Australian dollar to float freely and uh, they removed all the capital controls in Australia. So before that, they were like us. But we are still stuck in that. Uh, I don't think any. I don't think India will ever get out, frankly, because we don't have the mindset to accept the free market uh, outcomes. So uh, it's, it's, there are two different things. One is the actual level of the dollar rupee or the dollar yen. And the second is the actual, the conditions that prevail in a particular market based on the rules and regulations set by the government as to whether you can freely transfer amounts uh, between currencies or not. This is clear, Shorya. Yes, sir. Two different things. And also on that point, if you look at it, let's look at, it's, we are not really so much concerned about the actual value, but really more about the direction. If you look at the direction of the dollar rupee, and if you look at longer term charts, you will see it's much worse. It has come from almost like five dollars or five rupees or something like that, and kept on depreciating. Whereas if you look at the dollar yen, it is the other way, actually. The rupee has kept on long-term trend of the rupee is continuously depreciating. Here you don't see, uh, these guys don't have that much data actually. These guys have very little data, so you can't see much. But the dollar yen used to be almost one, uh, it used to be almost, uh, I think uh, 280 or some, or 400 or something like that in the 1970s. And it has come down so much. So it has come down to almost 25% of its value. And uh, whereas the rupee has continuously depreciated against the dollar. So the trend of the markets is more important than the actual uh, absolute value. rate. Yeah? Is that clear? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. So this when I say, so the examples that we are talking about uh, of uh, true AFV are, uh, you should know some of these examples. FX cross rates, FX forwards, only true for convertible currencies. Okay, so dollar Swiss, uh, dollar yen, Canada versus Australia, Australia versus US, etc. Synthetic uh, options and their synthetic equivalents. Okay, this you have done already. Options and synthetic equivalents, long call, short put, what are the synthetic equivalents? These are all AFB, true AFB. Okay, put call parity is, is a true AFB relationship in the sense that if the rates go out of line, you can actually do the arbitrage. Okay, so these are all examples, options and synthetic equivalents, so including uh, some of the ones that you will do later, which is, we have a topic on this, which is conversions and reversals. Okay, 
these are specific names that we have which you will we'll just quickly cover them so synthetic equivalent so we can say including conversions and reversals actually we don't need to say it, but because these are special names including conversions and reversals so yeah okay put call parity these are all examples of uh, true AFP fake AFP is example is given here all option valuation models are examples of fake AFP all right now that you have a good understanding of this let's continue with this so this why did we have all these discussions uh, the discussions of uh, uh, fair value models and all that to understand the importance of uh, the arbitrage pricing arbitrage free valuation principle that is you set up you find out if there's a synthetic then find out the cost of the synthetic and the rule is that that the cost of the synthetic should be equal to the actual market price the cost of the synthetic position should be equal to the cost of the direct position taken through the market price to the direct market price if there's any variation between the two there's an opportunity to and make the two converge to each other like we did in the case of dollar in the case of the euro yen example right we saw that the uh, these are the three markets direct market for euro yen and indirect market by trading in euro dollar fx and dollar yen indirectly creating a synthetic euro yen position the cost of a synthetic is 125.90 and the cost of the direct is 125.92 so we will sell the direct and buy the synthetic and as we do it in volume they will converge to each other this this logic is very important to understand the logic of arbitrage free valuation uh, the process of arriving at an afv at a theoretical price and where you have fake you have AFV and uh, you know why option why OBMs are fake AFV that is important to understand because the books don't really explain it so now we'll come to a continuation here in uh, the um, in our estimate of Nattenberg okay let's uh, let's look at this uh, in, in the I will continue with the Nattenberg book I have I opened the book? I don't think I've opened the book. Let me just open the book. We'll just open these two. Okay, this acrobat is a little slow. We'll open this also. So we want to go to the Nattenberg book. And we want to uh, interpret this here. What does our note say? Page 216 in book, meta is 225. So I type 225 in the meta. That takes me to page 216. Okay, they are talking about this guy is talking about something called a synthetic market. I can make this a little bigger. I can make it even bigger so you guys can see this well. Okay, now you see that this is talking, he's talking about uh, something called a synthetic market. So we need to understand this concept. Okay, this is the next concept that we are covering. This is all part of our discussion on fair value models. Okay, because these are all related to the idea of arbitrage free valuation. Now we will also be talking about these are also examples of a fair value model. Okay, this is going to create a fair value model of the uh, market price, a fair value model of the direct market price for an option. Okay, uh, or a uh, uh, market price for an option. Yes. Somebody saying something. Okay. All right, so let's try to understand this continuing uh, with our discussion of uh, AFB and fair value models. Okay, synthetic market, try to understand what he's trying to say here. Uh, you can study it further from the book. Okay, so I will make only minimal notes here. So uh, this is the synthetic market. Okay, so what is he saying? The difference between the call and the put price is referred to as a synthetic market. Okay. And then he's, he's made two statements. So first he's saying, he's defining something called a synthetic market. And he's saying that this is equal to the difference between the call price and the put price, okay? 
And then he's saying another thing. He's making a second statement, which is that absence of interest or dividends. Okay, I've added one more condition. Absence of ignoring interest plus dividends plus bid offer spreads. Okay, no bid offer spread, which means all the prices you see, those are mid prices. Normally, when we refer to prices, those are mid prices, unless we qualify them by saying they're bids or offers. And so here I'm saying that there's no bid offer spread. Okay, let's say ignoring interest. Okay, ignoring interest means actually let this is mean that interest is zero, dividend is zero, bid offer spreads are zero. Okay. All are zero. Okay. Uh, so ignoring all this, what he's saying, he's making a second statement that uh, the value of the synthetic market can be expressed as this. This is what he's defining as a synthetic market. And this should be the value of the synthetic market underlying minus exercise. Okay. Underlying price minus exercise price. So he's saying that there's a, he's giving an example here. Let's look at the example briefly, then we'll go and understand these, these statements properly. Uh, here, okay. He's giving an example of a June 100 call. This is 100 is the strike, okay? June is the expiration, 100 is the strike, premium is five, and the 100 put is $3, okay? So what he's saying is, because the relationship is call price minus put price should be equal to underlying minus exercise. Okay, and the underlying is at, at 102. Okay, he's mentioned that before. And so therefore, RHS is equal to two, LHS is equal to two. Okay, so that's what he's trying to say here. So, so two statements that he has made, def defining the synthetic market and setting the fair value of the synthetic market. So let's understand those statements. So first he's saying synthetic market is equal to call premium minus put premium. Now, go back to, why is he saying that? Synthetic market means it's actually what he's trying to say is, synthetic Yeah, so He's saying that this, what he's talking about, what he's not, he's not mentioned these words, but he's really talking about the synthetic underlying asset, which means if you're doing this for Microsoft, okay? So if you're looking at Microsoft call premium minus Microsoft put premium, that should be the synthetic uh, market for the common stock of Microsoft. That's what he's meant here, okay? So he's not clarified that, so I'm clarifying that for you. When you say synthetic market, synthetic market means you already know what synthetic means. It's artificial. It's not the direct market price. It's a synthetic or roundabout price. And price for what? It's a, he has not mentioned this, but you should understand this as referring to the underlying asset market. Okay? So if called, Microsoft calls, Microsoft puts, that means here synthetic market for Microsoft common stocks, which is the underlying for these options. Okay, that's what we mean here. Synthetic market in the context of options. So he's saying call premium minus put premium. Why is he saying this? Let's understand the first statement. Why is he saying this is equal to the uh, put premium, uh, call premium minus put premium? Okay. Anybody remembers what was the synthetic equivalent for the, when we did the equivalence? What was the synthetic equivalent for the log underlying? Anyone remembers? Long underlying, what was the synthetic equivalent? If you go back to your CME option strategies. Long futures, this is a long underlying. We have this in our notes as well. If we go back to our notes, I'm not going back there, but if we go back to our notes, we can see long. It was uh, long call plus short put. Correct. Very good. Yes, so it was long. You can see this here in the CME as well. Long futures. This is an example of long underlying because you can have options on futures. Those are called futures options. And in the CME book also, it mentions that, and we have it in our notes as well. 
that the synthetic equivalent is long call plus short put okay now what happens when you go long call and you sell a put you buy a put call and you sell a put what happens in terms of your cash flows you have to obviously pay for the call and when you sell the put you receive the put premium so you pay the call premium and you receive the put premium okay so in this sense this is your net cost on the RHS. Can we say that? I pay the, if I'm looking at the net cost of creating my synthetic long position, what will I do for synthetic long underlying? I will buy the call and I will sell the put. When I buy the call, I have to pay the call premium. So let's take this example, which is given in the book. He's giving the example, $5. So if I want to create a synthetic long underlying, I buy the call and I sell the put. So in terms of my total cash outlay, I buy the call, I have to put up $5 and I sell the put, I receive $3, okay? And this is why I'm saying that I need to add another assumption that is no bid offer spread, zero bid offer spreads. So you can both buy and sell at the mid price, okay? So is this clear now, guys? The LHS, here also it is, uh, here it is the RHS actually. <laughs> here I put the RHS, uh, different than the call price is equal to, maybe I should make it the same here. Maybe I should uh, just put it on this side to make this look the same. Uh, yeah, I'll just remove this equal to, all right? So I'm pulling this on the LHS. Okay, so call premium minus put premium. Now you understand why the LHS is call premium minus put premium because the LHS is showing you the cost of creating, the net cost of creating a synthetic long position. Are you following this so far, guys? Because this is buy call and sell put is a synthetic equivalent of buy underlying. Yes, that's why it's called the synthetic market because the difference between the call and the put price is referred to as a synthetic market because it is, that's the cost of creating the synthetic long underlying position. That's why I said this market is, synthetic market means synthetic underlying asset market, okay? Is this, are you following what I'm saying here? There are two statements here actually. First statement is this, and the second statement is this. Okay. What happened? Nobody is responding. Let me ask somebody now. I don't, I have to call up people and find out. Okay, let's ask uh, Bhavya. Are you following? Yes, sir. You're following what I'm saying here? Yeah. Yes, sir. So synthetic market is written as call premium minus call put premium because the uh, the synthetic log, uh, the synthetic equivalent of the log underlying, which you have already covered earlier, okay, which I just showed you, the synthetic equivalent of the long, the way you create a synthetic long underlying position is by buying the call and selling the put. And so if you do that, what is your net outlay? You have to buy the call, so you have to pay up $5 for the call, but you get to sell the put, so you receive money for selling the put, so your net outlay is only $2. $5 you pay for the call and put $3 you get from selling the put. So your net outlay is $2. So this is like the net cost of creating the synthetic long equivalent position. So that's why, so this is not a new statement. I mean, it looks like a new statement, but actually you're already familiar with this idea because you have already done the synthetic equivalence, okay? And you know that the equivalent of the long underlying is long call plus short put. So therefore, long call, pay the price, short put, receive the price, net price is here on the LHS, okay? And that is equal to the synthetic market. That's what he's calling the synthetic market, okay? He's calling it the synthetic market. Now, 
what he's saying now is that this is the first statement. So this is clear to everybody now, okay? So now the other thing he's saying is the arbitrage fee value for the synthetic market, which means that uh, here, this is the arbitrage fee value. This is the fair value, okay? This is the fair value using, so when I say, when I make a statement like this, arbitrage fee valuation for the synthetic market, when I make a statement like this, what it means is that uh, the fair value for the synthetic market, which means this call premium minus put premium, which is the synthetic long underlying position, this value should, this, this figure of the LHS should always be equal to a fair value that fair value using AFV met, uh, you know, method, the AFV methodology, the fair value we arrive at for this call premium minus put premium should be equal to underlying price minus strike price. Okay, that's what he's saying here in, in the book. You can read the book and see. What is he saying? The second statement he's making, first he's defining the synthetic market. And then he's saying the fair value for this is, which means the fair value of the call price minus put price, the LHS should be equal to, he's making the statement. Now let's see why the statement is correct, okay? It should always be equal to underlying minus exercise. Okay, that's what he's saying. So here he's giving an example that if this is true, then it does. there is no CRA opportunity here no opportunity to make money from arbitrage because the why why no opportunity because the synthetic uh, price okay the synthetic price of the lhs is equal to the fair value of the synthetic price which is basically like saying here that the market price is equal price is equal to fair value. So in this case, there's nothing for you to do because what convergence are you going to look for? Because they're already the same. So there's no convergence to look for, so there's nothing to be done. That's what he's saying here, okay? This, uh, let's go back to this, yeah, okay. So today's discussion is a little bit spread between these two notes, okay? But uh, you are following the discussion, so you can uh, see both of them are accessible to you, okay? So we are actually, we just had this discussion earlier about the fair value models, uh, setting the context properly, and then we are continuing with the discussion of uh, fair value AFV relationships in, in the auction markets, okay? And so here we have the synthetic market and the AFV for the synthetic market. So here he's saying call premium minus put premium should be equal to this. Now, why should this be true? Why should this statement, it's actually not very well explained in the book actually, the theoretical uh, underpinning for this relationship is not well explained, but uh, let me show you how you can understand this better. Okay, so if we are we are referring to the Nattenberg book. The page number is given, but let me explain this. Okay, why? So, okay, fine. Small case is fine. Why should RHS equal? I'll go back to okay, or vice versa. Okay, why? Now let's understand this. Okay, now uh, if you uh, let's look at the total cost. Okay, LHS. Okay, is equal to let's let's uh, let's put now let's rewrite this. Okay. Let's rewrite this. Let's re rewrite this and say this R we repeat this or this whole thing we have to change the brackets a little bit to be consistent. Let's just make it first bracket. All premium minus put premium. Okay, and let's put this within a second bracket. And let's put 
the let's take one of the terms from here let's take the strike price to this side okay so we will write this as plus strike price and we will take it in a uh, no sorry put it on the wrong side of the plus we'll put the plus strike price we'll put it in second bracket okay and then we are saying this okay so we can do this okay so if LHS is equal to RHS, then we just take strike price to the side and we write this whole expression. What is this? This is the net outlay. We are really focused on net cash outflow, okay? Net cost in terms of cash outflow. And remember, we are ignoring interest and all that, okay? And if you see at the beginning of this chapter, this chapter, which starts on, I don't know, maybe two, three pages earlier, option arbitrage. He has clarified these are all European options. Okay, there is no early exercise. These are all European options. And so we'll discuss, we'll make use of that property. Okay. Now, so we write it like this. So what is this now? Let's look at it. On the LHS, essentially what we have put is the total cash outlay of executing a synthetic long underlying position okay so let's write it like this write it properly in english so that you understand later on when you're studying it it becomes clear to you then you understand why he came up with this formula because he has not explained it well in the book okay total cash out so here the lhs is equal to okay so here LHS is equal to total cash outlay of executing a synthetic long underlying position. Okay. Why is this the total cash outlay? Think about it. What is the first term on the LHS uh, at a high level here? Call premium minus put premium. What is call premium minus put premium? That is, I buy the call. I have to put up $5, I sell the put, I receive $3. So net outflow for me is $2, okay? So call premium minus uh, put premium is, call premium minus put premium is the, this term here is the cost of putting on the synthetic long position by buying a call option and selling a put option. Now, plus the strike price. Okay, I said the LHS is equal to the total outlay, total cash outlay. Now, why do I need to add the strike price cost? Okay, let's take this example, $100, okay? So let's say I buy the 100 call at five and I sell the 100 put at three. So I put up $2 initially, and let's say these are three month options, okay? Now, at the end of three months, two things can happen. You can see these scenarios being analyzed in the book. At the end of three months, two things can happen. The price can either be above 100 or it can be below 100. If the price is above 100, I hold the 100 call and the put is worthless because it's a 100 put. If the price is above 100, then this put is worthless. Nothing will happen to me on account of this put, but I will exercise my 100 call, okay? So I will exercise my 100 call and I will go long underlying at 100. So therefore, what I have done is, I have got, I, I, okay, let's complete the other scenario as well. So I will go long at 100. The other thing that's possible is if you, we ignore the prices, uh, we, we ignore one scenario where the price is equal to exactly 100. So we consider only two scenarios where the price is above 100 and below 100. So if the price is above 100, then I buy the call, I exercise my call, the put expires worthless, and I go long at 100, okay, by exercising the call. Now if the price is below 100, I, the call is worthless, and the person who has bought the put for me from me will exercise the put and force me to buy the stock at 100. So in either case, I go long the stock at 100. Is this clear? 
if you go long 100 call and short 100 put, okay, and then at expiration, either the price is above 100 or the price is below 100. In either case, what happens, you end up going long the stock at 100. Okay, so if you're exercising the put, that's why you need to put the strike price here as an outlay because what are we saying? Total cash outlay of executing a synthetic long underlying position. Total cash outlay is two steps. First, you need to buy the call and sell the put. The net of the okay. So we'll stop it here. And we'll stop the... Uh... Okay, so the class is dismissed. Uh, you guys can leave. And whoever has a question, conceptual question, then you can stay back. And the rest of you guys, the rest of you can leave. Yeah. If you have a conceptual question, then you ask me first, then I'll stop the recording after that. And then we will deal with any administrative questions. Sir, uh, sir I have a question, sir. Okay, is it a conceptual question? Yes, sir. Okay, go ahead. Sir, I uh, use that optionprice.com um, uh, site. And for that, I did use that uh, short time. I, I actually observed it later during the examination, so I could not ask, but I would like to ask right now that even for short uh, short days, like if I say like five days or seven days, the theta is never positive in my uh, uh, thing. But uh, in the, it was written that uh, for short term options, the theta is positive for long term it is negative. I did know about that, but what uh, like in practice in this site, I did not see this thing happening. So that was my question. Sir. So, so, so yeah. Okay. So that maybe I should change the language a little bit. Uh, you good that you pointed it out. I should change the language. We can look at it right now. So let me just clarify that. Okay. First is the theta as a, the sign of the theta. Okay. So that positive, uh, you know, that, that uh, positive which you read about that for short term options, the, for short option positions, theta is positive. That positive is in the sense of favorable. That somebody asked me about Shorya and I gave a positive uh, recommendation. That means I said that Shorya is a good student and all that. So if that positive is in the sense of favorable, not in the sense of mathematical sign, negative, positive. You understand that? That's why yes, the solution has arisen. Okay, so I need to change the language. Good, good that you pointed it out. Okay, that shows that you're thinking about these issues. Okay, so just to answer that clearly, the theta of a long option position will never be positive. It will always be negative mathematical sign wise. Okay, so whether you are long call or long put, the theta, the mathematical sign of the theta will always be negative to show that if nothing else changes, and this goes from 30 to 29, then the option will lose value. That's why the minus, so you will subtract 0 0.054 from 3.019 on day 29 to give you the fair value. You will subtract my Can you, uh, okay. Yeah. Can you do the put setting as well? In the below calculate, there is a put setting as far as I remember. Below the calculate button. Put setting? Long call. Like what? No, no, just below the calculate button. Yes, long call, long uh, gamma. So what should be the setting or uh, the theta by value is never positive mathematically? No, theta is never going to be positive when you have a long call position, okay? When you How about short call? Sorry? How about short call, short call? Yeah, in the case of if you can put a short call, if you want to put a short call, okay, then you can put a short call theta, okay? Uh, here, short call theta, okay? Yes, sir. And now, uh, now we do the calculate thing again. So, we're... okay. So you can see the short call theta. Okay. So because see, uh, these are given for these uh, Greeks are given for long op long positions. Okay, sir. Okay, sir. These are given for. Regardless, what setting we select, it will show in the context of long, uh, long, uh, long options only. Long call, long put options. Yeah, these are shown as uh, implicitly for long positions, okay? That's yes, why the theta is always negative. Now, if you have a short position, 
then the theta will become positive in the sense that mathematically positive because minus minus becomes plus. Okay, because your sir. position is minus, you're short. Okay. okay, so minus minus will turn it positive mathematically. But what okay, I sir. Said there, let me change the language there also going back because uh, it's a good point that you raised where I talked about the theta. That theta is positive. Okay, that positive is in the sense of favorable. So maybe I should not have used the word theta because, uh, I mean, I should not have used the word positive because I have used the word positive earlier in a mathematical sense of plus minus. So where we have theta mentioned, I'm trying to go back now. Uh, yeah. Somebody's audio is not uh, switched off. Okay. Yeah, all the people who are here, actually, our audio is on. Okay. Audio is off, so that's fine. Okay. So, uh, yeah, let's go back to your theta here, which strike uh, theta, where I've mentioned theta. Well, I will mention check this yeah so Sharia, if you look at this has positive negative theta this is a language that is used in the in the industry but this is not mathematically positive this is actually in the sense of favorable Okay, that's why I've clarified this here. Benefits from the passage of time, okay? Positive, negative, this is, let me clarify that here, okay? Um, and let me write this as, so this positive, negative is in the sense of not in the positive, here positive, negative is not in the, uh, so let me clarify that, so here, uh, positive and negative yeah it, it is actually it, it's 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 true also from a uh, you know mathematical point of view because when you plot it it will have positive but really what we try to talk about are uh, Okay, is this clear, Sarya? Yes, sir. Okay, so that's what we mean here, okay? Yeah, anything else? So this is clear, yeah. So short option positions yes, will always have positive, uh, a favorable impact from theta because if nothing changes, the option will lose value and that will show up as a, as a profit for you. Okay, sir. Yeah, anybody else has any other question? Yes, sir. So just to clarify, uh, this uh, call premium and call price are the same thing. Like we can use interchangeably the premium word and the price. Correct, correct, correct. Premium and price are the same thing. That will also remind you that insurance companies are in the option selling business because what they are collecting from you is the option premium. Okay, sir. That's why insurance, all these payments, these are called premiums. Okay, sir. Right? Yeah. So yeah, you can use them interchangeably, the two terms. Okay. Thank you, sir. Okay. Yeah, okay. All right. Anybody else? Any other theory? Any other conceptual question? Okay, none. Okay, so we'll close the meeting and, and nobody has any administrative questions. One thing, sir. One more thing, sir. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Vega is considered a volatility, but they are not the same thing. What does that mean, sir? Where have I, have I written that somewhere? No, sir. No, sir. Like I was seeing like Vega implies volatility, but it was not showing exactly what implied volatility. Like what does that mean, sir? No, Vega is actually not 
necessary to imply ball. Vega is actually the sensitivity of the option. So Vega is showing the sensitivity to the eyeball. So remember the eyeball will change or, or actually in more general terms to the ball input. So if you change the ball input by 1%, okay, one unit here. So what the Vega is showing you is how much will the option premium change if you change the ball input by one unit. That's what it is showing you. So Vega is slightly different. Vega is like showing you the sensitivity of the, of, these are all you can think of these as uh, sensitivity analysis. That is something that you guys are familiar with and it's an easy thing to relate to. And uh, it's also conceptually correct. These are all examples of sensitivity analysis. So you are actually, this Vega is showing you the sensitivity of the option price to a change in the ball input. Okay, that's what it is showing you. So it could either be the theoretical price as given by a model, or it could be the market price. To imagine that the market is pricing the options by using the same kind of model. So when the market wants to raise the price of the model, the market changes the eyeball. The market now says, okay, now the eyeball will be 35 instead of 25. So the price will change because the eyeball input has, the ball input in the OVM has changed and the market is using that to price the option. So in this case, it is the eyeball because it will the ball input that will create a theoretical price equal to the market price. So is this clear now, Sorya, that eyeball is, eyeball is a different thing. Eyeball is the ball input in the OVM that will give you a theoretical price equal to the market price. Okay. So eyeball is not a sensitivity measure. Okay. It is a, a measure of it is basically the particular ball input which creates a model output which is equal to the market price. But isn't Ival said that it it implies that how much the value underlying asset is going up and down and by that sense it is a sensitivity thing only? No, no, it's not a sensitivity thing. So it's not correct to refer to Ival as a sensitivity thing. It, the Ival is an estimate which we will come to later in the further discussions. We will come to this idea of what exactly is the Ival. Okay, so it is referring to the volatility of the underlying asset. Okay, this asset which has a price of this. So it is referring to that volatility. It's an estimate of that volatility. Okay, it's like saying, you see, it's, it, let, let's try to understand it this way. If I say that uh, the temperature in Delhi over the next, uh, temperature in Delhi over the next uh, one month, is going to have a range of 25 Celsius. That means the low might be uh, five Celsius and the high might be 30 Celsius. Okay, suppose I make a statement like this. Okay, are you following? So I make a estimate that the range of uh, temperature in Delhi for the next 30 days will be 25 Celsius, low of five Celsius, high of 30 Celsius. Now, I could also say that the range will, no, it won't be 25, it will be only 15 degrees. So the low will be 10 Celsius and the high will be 25 Celsius. I could say that, or I could say it will be 17 degree range. So these are all statements about how much the temperature will vary. Okay. Now, here what I can talk, the Vega is something like, it's a bit like saying, suppose this is the rainfall estimate. Okay. Suppose this is the rainfall estimate. Now, the vega in this case will be the sensitivity of the rainfall estimate to the change in the temperature variation. So if I have temperature range of 25, there will be certain amount of rainfall. If I have a temperature range of 15, then there'll be some other amount of rainfall. Are you following, Sir Shorya? Yes, sir. So this is the kind of statement we are making here that the ball is referring to a range of temperature. Okay, and now based on that temperature, something else is happening, which is the rainfall. 
the rainfall is connected to the temperature range. So in the wall, we are talking about the range of temperature. But in the Vega, we are talking about the sensitivity of the model output to one of the model inputs. So this is a rainfall model now. Okay, this is my rainfall estimate. And one of the inputs in the model is the temperature range. So if I have a change in the temperature range, the rainfall estimate will change. Now, what is this Vega measuring? The Vega is measuring the, how much will the rainfall estimate change if I change the temperature range by one Celsius? Are you following now, Sharia? Yes, sir. Now you're following, the, this is a different kind of thing. So in this case, the wall, there is a certain wall input. You can enter 25, you can enter 20, 27. In a way, it is deriving its value from volatility. The option price is deriving its value from volatility, right? The option price is connected to the wall input. Okay, it will be affected by the wall. Yes, sir. If you change this, this will change. Now, what the Vega is measuring is how much will this change if you change this? Got it? Slightly different thing. Yes, sir. Yeah? So one is the sensitivity measure, and one is the input, and one is the output. And the sensitivity is connecting the rate of change of the output as a result of the input, of the change of the input. I've got a message on my Zoom. Why, why have I got a message on my Zoom? I don't know what is happening. Yes, Sharia? Is this clear? Yes, sir. Okay. Anything else? No, sir. Okay, fine. So we'll end the meeting here. We'll stop.